Hi, everyone. Thanks very much for coming here today. And for me, it's a big honor to speak at Ruby Kagi in front of you. My name is Alex. I am a software testing engineer. I'm not a programmer, though I do program a lot. I'm use, I've been using Ruby for the last, I think, eight years. And I work the uh, last seven years at a company called TopTal as a quality architect. I'm Paul Duger on Twitter, but I rarely tweet, so if you've ever heard of me, that's because of my open source work. I'm a committer to Selenium project. Does anyone here know Selenium? Yeah, a few people know, great. I'm a lead maintainer of Selenium web driver RubyGem, so if you use it, or for example, if you use Capybara, you actually use a bit of my work. And I'm also uh, a core developer to Water Project, which is web application testing in Ruby, uh, if you've ever heard of it, great. If not, and you're interested, please approach and say hi to me. A small announcement is that yesterday uh, we have tagged uh, a new major version of Selenium called Selenium 4 Alpha 1. So if you use it, that's a sort of big news. There is a parallel conference, Selenium Conf, happening in Tokyo, like today. Um, however, today, we're going to talk about something completely different. Uh, we're going to talk about Crystal Ball, uh, which is a tool that allows to predict test failures. So we're going to start by talking about what problems of regression testing exist. Then I'm going to introduce you to Crystal Ball as a tool that might solve some of those problems. And finally, we're going to do a short live demo of it. So let's start. Who here writes tests? Um, I think half of the people write tests. Okay, um, that's good. So in many programming languages, we have things like static analysis type checkers that allows us to program fast and, make and be sure that we haven't broken anything. Um, in Ruby, we don't have those yet, uh, but as we know, we will have those. So tests are pretty much essential for any uh, successful and fast software development. Tests are vital. We write the tests, then we change the code. We can run them and make sure that we haven't broken anything. And because of that, we write a lot of tests. And uh, at some point, tests start to be slow. So if you've ever worked with a big, for example, a Rails code base, you probably have had a test that run like more than one minute, five minutes, maybe more than 10 minutes. So uh, if you, if you do have a test suite or ever worked with a test suite that runs more than one minute, it's like more people that <laughs> than who writes tests. <laughs> yeah, so tests are slow. And uh, which, uh, what is even worse is that quite often tests tend to be integrated. And by integrated, I mean that they, so you have a, like a class, a component, you have tests for this component, but then there are some different uh, tests that actually use this class indirectly. Um, we, we, we don't always stub out all the dependencies of components, so we have this implicit use of uh, tests, of, of, of code across the tests. And uh, if you ever stumbled upon a situation when you change your class, change the test for this class, and then some different tests start failing, because it also needs to be updated, that is exactly the problem of integrated tests. And because of that, we actually need to run all the tests on every change. So we change a single part of our application, but we need to run all of the tests to make sure nothing has been broken. Uh, but because tests are slow, this is very painful, right? We change just a little bit of the code, and then we need to write for a very long time to uh, verify we haven't broken anything. We also know that mass haste tests. I don't know if anyone likes tests, but for good or for worse, we, we have them and we need them in, in Ruby. But uh, good news, great news is uh, testing and uh, general in general, Ruby community is an amazing place. So more than four years in the past, uh, Aaron Patterson has written a blog post called Predicting Test Failures. And I'm going to quote him, running tests is the worst. Seriously. Uh, it takes forever to run them, and by the time 
they're all done, I forgot what I was doing. And he has proposed uh, a solution, sort of algorithm, that would allow to predict which tests can fail based on the changes in, in the Git repository. A couple of years later, uh, Pavel Schutzin, amazing engineer and my ex colleague, has uh, made a sort of proof of concept of this uh, solution proposed by Aaron. Uh, he has made a Ruby gem that uh, understands what changes are done in the Git repository and then can predict which tests should be run based on these changes. It worked really well, so we've invested time in that, into this, and then a year later, a year and one month later, Crystal Ball 0 0.5 was released public. Uh, it was available in Ruby Gems, uh, the documentation portal and everything was out, so we could start using it, uh, which, is, which all started back with this blog post by Aaron. So what is Crystal Ball? It is a regression test selection library. So this means that from all your tests, it can select the ones that needs to be run to make sure uh, they haven't broken. Uh, the basic usage is like this. Uh, throughout the presentation, we're going to have we're going to use examples with a simple Rails and R spec app. So we have the spec helper, uh, just a typical Rail R spec helper, and at the top of it, we sorry, at the top of it, we uh, require crystal ball if our spec is run with crystal ball environmental variable set, and then start the map generator start gathering information that is that will be used by crystal ball later. So we do that, we run all our specs with crystal ball set to true, and it creates the so-called execution map. This is just a YAML file, and the most important part here is uh, it's just a hash, where the key is a, a pass to a particular test, and then a value is just an array of all the Ruby files that are used by this test. So then, let's say we start changing our app, we change a user model, we delete some validation line from it, and then we can run crystal ball, just like we would run our spec. It does its magic, builds its predictions, runs some sort of, some amount of tests, and in, the, in this example, one of those failed. So let's dive a bit more into it. So essentially, crystal ball has two, three, three parts. The first one is uh, the layer where, which generates a map from test to code, which test uh, we use which code. Then, based on that map, Crystal Ball predicts which tests should be run based on the changes in Git repository, and finally it runs those tests. First layer is called map generator, second is predictor, and the last one is runner. So let's, uh, let's talk a bit, about, a bit about each one of those, because Crystal Ball has uh, a lot more interesting stuff there. Map generators, this is the essence, uh, and this is the, one of the probably most complicated and important parts of Crystal Ball. This is the layer how we understand which code is used by which tests. It has a bunch of different strategies and a bunch of generators that, when used together, provide great results. And the first one is called coverage. This is exactly what uh, was proposed by Aaron in his original blog post. Uh, the way it works is that using the coverage API provided by Ruby standard library, we take the coverage before the test, then we run it, get the coverage after the test, and then just see if, if, if the coverage has changed. This is probably the code that is used by a test. If we put it into the code, it would look like this. We just require coverage started, get the results before the test, run the test, and uh, yield, yield example will mean run the test throughout this presentation, then take the coverage after running the test, and then just uh, select uh, a difference between those. So having this uh, map generator in Crystal Ball can produce somewhat similar result, where we have a user spec, uh, a single user spec, and it used four different files, uh, the spec itself, the user model, and uh, user mailer and application mailer for whatever reason. So it is very fast, it is pretty reliable, and for most cases it works really well. However, Crystal Ball provides a bunch of more 
uh, strategies for generation of more accurate maps. The next is called allocated objects. And the way it works is that it relies on trace point API. So it has a trace point to gather all the constants defined, then it uh, lets uh, the tests to be loaded, then another trace point to collect all the object allocations, run the test, and then just uh, get all the objects that were allocated during the tests and map them back to the Ruby files where the constants, the classes of these objects are defined. So let's, uh, let's look at the first part. It's a straightforward trace point uh, for a class. We just take uh, a module, well, a constant name, right, and uh, a path to a file where this constant is defined, and then just uh, sort of gather it into a simple hash. Then we load the tests, and then we add another trace point for a C call, uh, and it's, it's only enabled for example. And we search uh, in the trace point, we search only for method calls to new or allocate. And this is our objects uh, allocated during the test. We just store them into an array. So that's, that's pretty much it. Then we can map back our created objects to Ruby files. And if we run it for the same test we had, uh, user model spec, it actually has only two files. It, it actually allocates only user model and application record because crystal ball takes into account the hierarchy. Because user user is, inherits application record. Okay, moving on. Allocated objects is actually a bit slower than coverage because, it, because of the trace point, but uh, it gives great results. Uh, described class. So it is a pretty straightforward strategy. So again, it uses trace point to gather the information for constant definitions, load the test, run them, and then just find which file defines the constant, the so-called described class of the test. If you are not familiar with what described class is, then in, in this typical uh, RSpec test, uh, Described class is a constant that we pass as a first argument to describe method. So we've seen how trace point is used to gather constant definitions, and I'm going to skip that code. Now we just run the test, and then just uh, get the described class from using RSpec API, and then just get the file of where the constant is defined. So having this uh, run for uh, the same test, it just gives us user model, because that's, that's what we're describing in our test. It works uh, great. And then there is another strategy that is available uh, on demand, which, which uses parser gem. It is very useful because it allows to hook into um, static method calls, for example, class method calls or module methods. Uh, the way it works is that it, it parses all the source code again, to search for constant definitions, then run the tests. Then it takes the files that were used by the test, and these files are provided by other strategies. Uh, all these strategies work together. They can be combined to be together, but parser depends on others. And then in, in these files, it search for any calls to constants. So it's a bit more code. Um, I hope you can read it. But please bear with me. We just require a parser, and then for every source code, we parse it. It gives us a sort of abstract syntax tree. And then we just recursively map throughout uh, all, the, all this abstract syntax tree of a, a Ruby file, and then search for constant or constant assignment nodes. And then this is, this is, these are our constants that are defined. Then we run the test, and then we take used files provided by other map generators, and then we map through them doing the same thing. We load and parse uh, the files uh, recursively map into the abstract syntax tree. And then we search for send nodes, so method calls, and method calls to constants. That's, that's what, what we need. And then this is, this is our sort of static method calls. So if we take parser, 
strategy and run it for the same test, you can see that it gives us the same user application record and uh, user mailer. But what is more interesting is that it also gives us uh, a Gale code user job because actually user inside the user B we have uh, class method calls to this Gale code user job. So now we know that if this file Gale code user job has been changed, we need to run the, the tests for user model. So these are few strategies that can be used with any Ruby app, Ruby, Jam, Rails, Hanami, whatever. And then uh, Crystal Ball provides a few more strategies that are designed particularly for uh, libraries and frameworks. The first one is factory bot. Uh, we'll, I mean, we at our company use factories a lot. So we would like to know which tests we need to run when the factories are updated. And Crystal Ball allows to do that. It, uh, it patches factory bot so that when, it's, when factories are loaded, it, they're sort of collected. We know where they are loaded. And then we add another patch just to collect factories that were used during the test and then just run it. It's monkey patches, so I'm not going to show you the code. But if you happen to see this presentation online, the, the monkey is actually clickable. So if you click, you, you will go directly to the source code, which does this. And uh, if we run uh, this strategy for our test, you can see that uh, here it has two tests. And one of those actually used a factory from a user, but the other one did not. So if we, ch if we happen to change a user, factory, we only need to run the first test. Action view. So we use Rails a lot. And uh, Action view provides us uh, a way to understand which test needs to be run when views and partials are changed. So it uses monkey patches to collect all the views that are compiled and then just run the test. And now we know those monkey patches. Uh, so skipping the code. And uh, if we run this strategy for our user model test, it gives an empty array because obviously model do not compile any views. But if we take something more sophisticated like a controller spec, it actually gives us uh, a couple of views, which is a index, uh, home index view and just uh, application layout. Next is internationalization. Um, any Rails app use translations. So we use uh, Crystal Ball has a strategy to patch internationalization so that when translations are loaded, they're stored, and then when they're used, and then when it runs the test, it knows uh, which were used. Again, it relies a lot on monkey patches. So skipping the code and our user model test do not use any translations. But uh, if we take, uh, for example, a system test, which for sign-in functionality, it actually involves uh, getting some translations from the device and YML file. And last but not least is a tables map generator. It's, it's a bit special, designed specifically for Rails. Um, it is used to understand which uh, tables are used by which models. And then when we write a database migration for these tables, it, uh, it is, it's going to be used to understand which test needs to be run after the migration. So it uses trace point to search for constant definitions, then it runs the test, and then it just sort of collects all the table names from all the used constants and stores them into a separate uh, map file. So trace, I'm, I'm omitting to a trace point because we've seen that before. Uh, Let's say we've gathered all the constants definitions. Now we run the test, and then we just iterate through all the descendants of active record. And if it was, uh, if, if such a constant is defined, we just store a table name into a hash. Um, and it has a separate file, and it would give something like that. For it. So the key is uh, a name of the database table. And then its value is just a list of files which are somehow defining this table or interacting with it. So I'm going to show how the, show you how this is used a bit later. And uh, 
predictor is the second component of crystal ball, which is actually responsible to understanding what has been changed in the repository and what needs to be run. And uh, just like with map generators, there are a few different uh, predictors. You combine them together, you can write your own with a very simple API, um, and uh, it gives great results. So the first one is just a modified execution paths. Uh, we just take all the files that were modified from the Git repository, and then having this uh, map created before, we can find which test needs to be run for these modified files, and then just run them. So if we put it into the code, we just use a Git library, Git gem. We load the repository for a current directory, compare it to a head revision, and then just map through it, searching for all the diffs of a modified type or a new file. So if we, for example, have a change like that, where we, uh, where, where we change a user model, the predictor uh, will give us somewhat similar results. So it will tell us you need to run uh, tests for a user model spec, and this, this, these are the, the tests that needs to be run. The next uh, predictor that exists is called modified specs, and the way it works is that it, uh, it's just very straightforward. If the spec file has been changed, just run it. No need to have a pre-built uh, execution map, uh, we just change a spec file, and then the predictor tells us, okay, just run it. Nothing, nothing fancy here. Modified support specs. So if you have a huge RSpec test suite, you probably use support files like shared examples, shared contexts, or, I don't know, custom matchers, stuff like that. So Crystal Ball uh, is capable to understand in that uh, when the spec support file was changed in the Git, it will find the tests that are using these support files and run them. So imagine having two different specs, for example, the first one for a tasks controller, uh, which use a shared context called project setup, and then the other one called, the, the other spec for projects controller, which uses the same shared context. If we change this shared context, like, we remove some uh, let, uh, then crystal ball predictor will tell us that you need to run this, these two specs for projects controller and tasks controller. Associated specs, it's, uh, it's again not very specific, it's, uh, it's more of a manual one. If you've ever used um, guard, uh, or if, for example, if you use Vim and Rails Vim and alternate functionality, it's somewhat similar. So we manually associate how production code or maps to a test code, and then Crystal Ball will just run them. So we just uh, create an association from uh, pass a regular expression, and then how this uh, file that matches this regular expression is associated to a test file like that, so no, nothing fancy here, but it's very convenient for guard-like and for convention-heavy applications. And uh, the last predictor is modified schema. It actually is the one that uses the table map. So it, it, it takes a, a schema div, so it loads database schema, search what has been changed there, and then it finds which models defines the tables that are changed in the schema. And then from, uh, from, from these models, it knows which test needs to be run and run them. So if we have a migration that um, changes a tasks table, and that's some new column called uh, title, uh, the predictor will, will, will go through a table map and execution map and will say that we need to run a task, tasks controller specs, the, specs for the model itself and some uh, system tests for tasks. So it's very convenient when you're writing a lot of migrations and you don't, you, you want to be sure that you haven't broken the tests accidentally. All right, this is all for predictors. And the last component is runner. Right now there is only one runner uh, which uses RSpec. 
uh, and it is exactly what is used uh, when you type bundle exact crystal ball. So it's, it's straightforward. It just builds the prediction and then just runs the specs, uh, delegating it to our spec. Um, it's, it is, it, it's not hard to add more runners, for example, for mini tests or Cucumber or whatever uh, other test runner you want to use. But at this point, Crystal Ball ships only with our spec because we, we mostly use our spec in, in our code base. Okay, um, time for a demo. So let me, okay, is that, is that okay? Do you guys see it? No? Okay, so this is a simple Rails app. So I took, a, if you've ever heard Everyday Rails book, they, they have a simple Rails application and I took it. And I have already uh, changed my spec helper so that on top of it, I require crystal ball and do everything that I had in the example. So if there is a crystal ball variable set, I'm going to require it and some additional strategies. And I'm going to start gathering the execution map, uh, the coverage strategy, allocated object strategy, described class, factory bot, and then a couple of internationalization and action view that are specific to Rails. And also I have a tables map generator uh, for, for the migrations. Okay. So now actually let's run our spec with crystal ball true. Uh, it will now create all these uh, YAML files with all the maps. So it's running, some system tests are running. Okay, it's pretty fast, right? This is for the purpose of presentation, but overall there are 70 different tests. And now let's see. So we have this new file, crystal ball data which has all the information about our tests and which Ruby files are used by these tests. And we also have a tables map. So there are just four tables in this app, users, nodes, uh, projects, and tasks. Okay. So if we run crystal ball now, um, it won't do anything because we haven't changed anything. So let's, let's start doing this. Let's do the example we had in the, in the presentation and let's change a user model and we're going to remove the validation and let's run crystal ball. It starts to glow, does some sort of magic and then builds predictions and then start to run tests. Okay. So it has run 55 different tests. One of them has failed. There are many tests probably because user it's used everywhere across the test's code base. Yeah, so one of the tests fail, the test for validation itself. Okay, so I'm gonna reset the changes and uh, let's, for example, change a view for a project show. So there is this owner field and I'm gonna remove it. And I'm gonna run crystal ball again. Okay, so overall it has decided to run five different tests and one of them, well, it was actually expecting the owner has failed. So it works for compiled views. Um, now, for example, let's change the translation file. Um, for sign up, for example, let's change the translation to hey, Kubikagi and run the crystal ball. Yep, it ran overall 12 different examples. One of them has failed. That was particularly looking for this uh, string. And um, for the final, let me try to create a new migration just to show you how schema migrations, uh, st tables map works. So I'm going to create a migration that adds uh, a full column to a tasks uh, table, just uh, like that. And then I'm gonna run the migration. Okay, 
it completed. So now I have this changed schema and I have this new full string. Here um, I need to recreate a test database just to be sure. And now let's run crystal ball. And it will understand that because we've changed the tasks table, we overall need to run 61 different tests and none of them has failed. So it works pretty well. Okay. So that was all for the demo. Um, Crystal Ball is there for quite some time already. It's available at this URL, toptal.github.io slash crystal ball. There are documentations there, examples, explanations of everything. So please start using it if you, like many other people, suffer from slow tests. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Alex, and if you have any questions, I will be very happy to answer them. Questions? No? Well, I guess no. Then. Yeah. Thank you.